the at, at Cuckoo Hill made the papers, um, and it it was quite controversial um, because um, I will I'll, I'll just I'll tell you why it was quite controversial. So this is Aidan Morella. He he gives a great account um, in the Tipperary Historical Journal. I think it's 1990, um, and it's online. So have a look at it. It's absolutely brilliant. It's also very funny. Um, but he he. They, they've come in to the Haggart in, in Heffernan's farm um, and they're at the back and then there's the house and here, come, here are the free stage in the front yard and there's the machine gun, Jim Newton set up his machine gun against a sort of a trellis or a, a wall, a small wall and they're firing out but James Heffernan and his workmen are in the front yard and the, here come, all they can see are free stage soldiers bearing down on them also shooting and like this is a terrifying thing as a civilian, um, and uh, he he uh, they take cover, but you know there's a lull in the firing, so he waves his handkerchief and he says, "There's nobody here, just us, so it's okay, just stop shooting." But uh, he claimed actually that the Free State actually, the Free State soldiers actually increased their shooting at that point, but um, uh, anyway, they eventually stopped and. Along, we don't know, but Avon Arana says down into the yard where, into the Haggard where, where the IRA were, um, comes a young private, John Hanley, and he's mowed down straight away by a machine gun fire. Um, so, what it looks like to the Free State, understandably, is a white flag has been waved and, uh, and, and then somebody's been mowed down. So, there, there was a surrender and then fire was opened again. So uh, it sounded like a, a terrible scandal and it made all the papers. Um, so the Nationalist, as we know, um, uh, almost all of the papers at the time uh, were very sympathetic to the, the Free State cause. And so the white flag, um, the abuse of the white flag made headlines and it was you know, a, a sign of how untrustworthy the IRA were. Um, but uh, the following week, in the newspaper after the initial reports, uh, James Heffernan, who himself was a Free State supporter, um, sent a, a very angry letter in and he explained what had happened, that the IRA men at the back didn't know anything about a white flag um, and it was just a very unfortunate uh, state of affairs and he, 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 sends, he, he sends the letter to all the papers and the Nationalist and the Clonmel Chronicle both published it, so um, he, he righted the wrong. Um, but interestingly enough, that was, I think, um, the 14th of September, or maybe the 19th of September, that paper came out. And right, that was down in the middle section on the bottom of one page, but up on the same page, at the very top uh, right-hand section, was the report that four prisoners were captured, and one of them was Jacqueline. And that was the, uh, the end of Jacqueline's um, command of the column. So he'd been ca captured on his way to a brigade meeting in Kilcash, uh, and the, this is Jacqueline here. Uh, so he was a he was a postman by trade, um, and as was his brother Joe, who was over in Wexford and was a volunteer in Wexford. And I think he was vice OC of the North Wexford Brigade. Is that right? That's yes, right, Joe. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they were up to their eyes in in IRA activity, um, and that's the very quick summary of of Jacqueline's um, command of the column. But um, last night when I was going through some things, trying to get everything together, uh, for some reason I pulled out this photo. Um, you know the way sometimes things twig when you look at things, you've seen them lots of times, but because you've done a bit more study and you know a little bit more, uh, things fall into place. So this man here is Ned, uh, Edward Dalton, who is Sean's Uncle Edward, and he was at Woodruff with the IRA. He was, I think he was a member of Jack Aylward's machine gun uh, one. And up here is Thomas Milani, who was the man who led the Free State troops on that very first ambush. So uh, this photo was taken on the 21st of April 1921 by a lady called Bridget Leeson. Uh, she had a photo uh, photo photography stu studio in Clonmel. Uh, and it, her house is also Brigade HQ. Um, and uh, there they are in the one photo. And little did they know that just over a year later, um, they were going to be on opposite sides. And I suppose, I, I don't think anything speaks more eloquently to the disaster that the Civil War was than that. 
Um, so um, that really is all I have to say. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much and um, thank you. And if there's any questions, just let like, or if you want to correct me on anything, please, please do. So thank you. sense from the uh, IRA troops, I suppose, locally, that they were that they were achieving something, or that even 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 at the end, you know, was there a sense of remorse, or was there a feeling that they had made the, their position known, or you know, you know, it's a difficult question. Yeah, it is a difficult question. I think. Um, I think it's I don't know. I think maybe Sean, you might be better um, qualified to answer that. No, you're better qualified. Hi, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sean. Um, I think there was very little heart for a fight, and I think you'll see time and time again it was the more professional soldiers that um, really were the ones who came through in the action. Um, a lot of times, um, they were fighting their friends. You know, I mean, they knew Tommy. They knew Tommy Ryan. The IRA knew Tommy Ryan. Tommy Ryan knew them, um, and and the same with um, Thomas Milani. So um, th there was a little heart for the fight, but I think there was an awful lot of um, loyalty to the Republic, and I do. I believe that's why they were there. Even for them, for them, they they believed the Republic was lost, um, and who knows? Maybe Michael Collins' method might have worked. Um, but they, they didn't believe in it, um, and so I think they were making a stand that the Republic would not be forgotten. That, that's my belief, um, but I don't think they had a heart. Their heart and soul wasn't in it. And the declaration that they could put out in the commandment was the first of all, the that position that the, uh, Oh, yeah, so, oh, the... the the, the proclamation in January 1922. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but really, they they believe that the republic had been betrayed, and that's that's what that said, wasn't it, John? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. These truck truckloads of staters, where were, were they even know? Because where were they yeah. from? Yeah, there were there were. So Proud's army was made up of a lot of recruits, and and I should have said that actually, as they were going. Um, there were a lot of people joining up to the Free State Army because they had um, they were being paid and, and there were very many previously volunteers that them there. Some of them were so so, but but more and more as they went on, there were new men coming in, men who had never been involved, um, and um, also men who had been um, let go from the British Army. But there was a core of good, very very experienced volunteers who really believed that. The, the free state was the way to go, the stepping stone approach to freedom. And they were very committed uh, on the free state side. Um, and, and a lot of them were, were given the high commission. So um, Tommy, Tommy Ryan, for example, uh, was a commandant. And, um, you know, and, and he, he was in that position within the IRA, but he, he, went, he went up quite a, you know, a few And of course they were also getting paid. They were getting paid, yeah. Yeah, they were getting paid. But I don't think, like it takes more than money to, to make you turn your back on your comrades. So I believe those men really in the heart and soul believed they were doing the right thing. Um, because I, I, I don't think, that they certainly weren't in the IRA for money. So I don't know if money was the motivating factor. Definitely money was the motivating factor for the new people who signed up, the people who've never been involved before. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's yeah. also the case in Clanmel that um, <coughs> Those who weren't for the anti-treaty people were against them and should leave town. Yeah, it, there was a lot, and there was a lot of yeah. ill feeling. They were actually forced to leave the town. Yeah, uh, and and there was a lot of ill feeling. Uh, well, Dan Breen talks about it uh, being built up after the truce when the IRA were were in the towns and out in the open, and there was a feeling uh, like they'd suffered, and therefore now their time was had come. Um, and, and the normal people maybe uh, resented the, the control they had. 
um, and certainly they, they, it was bad for business. So, uh, you know, money talks at the end. But yeah, uh, definitely an element of. Um, if you're not with a steward against us, absolutely. Whatever. Yeah, and if you weren't with us during the fight when things were tough, you're not with us now, even no matter what to mm. say. Yeah, Michael. Uh, am I right in saying that Tommy Ryan was pretty closely related to Babs Keating? Was he? I didn't no, know that. Well, 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 Babs Keating's name was, but I was around yeah. the way it would be known for the boat. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, yeah, these things were very old. He was his grand uncle. Really? Good. I just have a question there on yeah. Tommy Ryan, like, where he was made famous on Dirty Sunday. Was he a bad guy in the priest at Elmer? I now I don't know, but I I I don't know because I I haven't really studied that side his career enough to know. Well, as far as I know, my father served with him, and like it's a, to get to a position of importance, in the, you you had to be tough and you had mm. to be determined. So like. But that, yes. that was true within the yes. IRA as well. Oh, yeah. there, were no, yeah. there was no room for anybody. But, uh, as far as I know, he spoke earlier there about uh, Jim Nugent fired men from up over the town. My father, I think, was in one of those marches to Mass that morning because he often spoke of the chap that was shot. Your man was, what was he doing, Sean? The, the chap that was shot in the window. Was he he was up the prisoner, I think. He, yeah, but he, he was shouting up the IRA or something. Yeah. That's right, he, was, he, he came was to the window like and he wouldn't go away from it. Like, from my recollection now of my father said that, you know, your man, he was told to sit yeah. down and get in, get the hell out of it. Yeah. But yeah. he wouldn't let him, so some sniper fella shot him. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Jim Nugent's guns were fired down at my father anyway. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's personal at that point. <laughs> 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 He missed the money, but so did he. <laughs> As a young fellow, I travelled a lot into Redmond's town in a pony and trap because that was the only means of transport we had in the 50s. And the main uh, reason, well, come my mother, we, they came shopping every Christmas to Clonmel and Lord Mercy and Paddy McGrath and Draper and Gladstone Street. They'd get tea off of him for until they'd be able to pay it and whoever was getting confirmation of the owner had him a grand load of the call that was anyway all the way up and up. Now I don't know what the connection was, but they, they obviously knew Paddy McGrath. But like the point I'm making is we came by the side pony and side so Redmondstown. But my father never spoke of the ambush with Frank Torbner. And it was later on, like in life that I found out and no, he didn't talk, he spoke of some things that then he wouldn't talk about other things. But he, you know, it was funny that such a, a fairly major guy was shot in Redmond's mm -hmm. town. He never told us about it. And had, I don't recall yeah. him. Yeah, that's know, it. Probably when he was shot, uh, and he was out of the Civil War, that probably he didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was out of the Civil War. Oh, yeah. He, was, he, was, he wasn't expected, Thornton wasn't expected yeah. to live. But I was talking to Corey Thornton, who, who uh, Frank's son, um, and um, Corey was, was going to be here tonight, but he couldn't make it. But um, maybe he thought uh, Timberry was still too hot for my <laughs> But uh, and I, I promised we'd, we'd be kind to him this time around. But um, anyway, he told me that, um, just another family story, um, he said that when Frank Thornton was brought into the hospital in Clonmel and he was lying there and like the, the newspaper report said he was expected to die, he, he had 10 or 11 bullet wounds um, and he, um, he was lying there and he said, he started talking and the nurse was like, what's going on? And, and um, anyway, he fell asleep and he came too, I think, and then he said, oh, it was lovely, my brother came to see me. And uh, she looked at him and uh, she said, uh, where was your brother? And she, he said, he was just there at the end of the bed and uh, he spoke to me. And uh, that was Captain Hugh Thornton, Frank's brother, who was killed in, in Clonakilty uh, that, uh, just a few days later. He was actually on his way up to see Frank um, when he, he was shot and killed in, in Clonakilty. Um, so that's just the tragedy and it was at that time 
that he saw him at the end of the bed. So just one of those sad stories. Um, yeah. You don't get those in the history books, do you? No, you no, don't. You don't need no. uh, Just in relation to Tommy Ryan and Dan Breen, um, mm -hmm. Tommy Ryan and Dan Breen actually remain quite good friends post Civil War. And in one of the conversations that they had um, was in relation to the Battle of Carrigan, Battle for Carrigan Shore. Um, at not sure where the location was now, but. Uh, Breen had been dug in, Breen's column had been dug in, and Tommy Ryan actually moved in on their left flank. And the Ryan's recruits were nearly all raw recruits um, that were only after joining. And when the, when the gunfire started, a lot of them actually started to run for it. And trying to encourage them, Tommy Ryan went out in front of his men, and he was, would say, running up and down trying to encourage them and for some reason none of the bullets seemed to come in his direction and he he thought he was extremely lucky but in the conversation that they had afterwards Breen said to him I could have shot you at least 40 times <laughs> he said but um, for all time's sake he said there was no way I was going to do it and I think that epitomises kind of the relationship that was there between a lot of them that they might have fired guns but very often they weren't, they weren't aiming very hard to hit someone that they actually knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Dave, I came from, we come from around the same area as Cameron and Tommy Ryan. Oh, yeah. And while well, he got a lot of fame in the Bloody Sunday, but the general opinion in that area outside would be that he, was, he wasn't a good guy in the Civil okay. War. The people compared him to Dick Mulcahy. And by Christ, he wasn't good either. <laughs> <laughs> Good coverage of his path in Bloody Sunday. Right. But definitely, as the story that I would have had outside, and I'm working to only a few miles away from where he was, mm. that he wasn't good, and that he was probably one of the worst in the Civil War. Mm. Especially in his own local area. Oh dear. And well, I yeah. Don't think <laughs> well, except when Dan Green would have been friends. I don't think they would have been. Okay. Just, I uh, might be able to put something on to that. I, I don't hear myself. Is, um, in, in, um, in 1964, uh, Tommy Rain wrote a letter to, uh, to his day after 65. Tommy Rain wrote a letter to Dan Breen when he was in the, the set John uh, nursing home in, in, uh, in the year uh, Kill the Crony. And uh, the, the letter began, you know, to really to massage Green's ego anyway, because, you know, my, dear, my dearest beloved leader, the gracious Irishman of all times, and I was asking from Dan Breen, was, you know, to make an appointment to go and visit him. But, uh, or, uh, he, he was going to a wedding in Wicklow, a family wedding in Wicklow, and he called on his way to visit Dan Breen. And uh, the next letter that went between was, uh, he wrote to Dan Breen again, saying how sad he was to hear that when he called to the nurse home, that Dan Breen wasn't able to see him. And uh, Dan Breen got the two letters and he sent them to his son Donald. And uh, the kind of gist of the letter to his son Donald was, did you ever see such a heap of nonsense in all your life? <laughs> <laughs> so then the message mightn't have been that strong, but certainly the friendship wasn't either. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, but out in Clareland, uh, the 1st Battalion area, uh, our family home in Maidenstown, during the Civil War, both sides 